up guys today we're gonna take a look at the ghost box to determine whether or not it's a credible tool to contact spirits is it really a way to pick up communications from the dead or are a bunch of people just talking to their radios let's find out so first of all what is a ghost box a uh, ghost box is basically just a device that can loop through AM or FM frequencies and uh, play sounds and those sounds some of those sounds are apparently communications from the dead so you could ask it a question and it would supposedly give you an answer through that device right how exactly that would work isn't entirely clear and not just to me but apparently to everyone else as well and that in itself is already a pretty big concern because how can paranormal investigators claim that it's a credible tool when debunkers are the only ones that look into the science behind it Seems to me like that's something very important, especially if you want to go around proving the existence of ghosts, right? Sure, you don't understand the intricate workings of a lot of devices that you use in your daily life, but if someone didn't understand how those devices work, then you wouldn't have those devices, right? Now, we could be at a similar point in time with the ghost box as, for example, cavemen who understood that fire could heat things but not how to make fire. But if that's the case, then why is everyone spending their time trying to prove that fire heats things rather than trying to figure out how to make fire? Wouldn't that in itself be a much better way to prove that fire does in fact heat things rather than waiting for a lightning strike to hit a tree and then running back to town with a burning stick? Because that's pretty much what the paranormal investigators are doing right now. Point being, I think that the paranormal investigators are just asking the wrong questions. They're asking, does it work and how can I prove it? While really the question should be, if it works, then how does it work? You can't expect to prove something when nobody's looking at the science behind the device. So that's basically what I'm going to be trying to do now, but from a debunker's perspective. Now please understand that I'm making this video to help people. So if it does end up being a credible tool, then I'm just helping paranormal investigators figure out how exactly they should go about proving it. And at the same time, if they can't find an explanation that fits within the laws of proven science, then they shouldn't be wasting their time on this device. So let's take a look at how the ghost box might be picking up communications from the dead. The first option is the ghost would be able to send or manipulate radio signals near the device. And the second option is that the spirit could actually mess with your device so that the audio that comes out changes in real time. So let's look into both possibilities, but first let's start with the obvious. It's hard to distinguish what is radio and what is supposedly spirit communication because of the way that this device works. It constantly loops through radio stations broadcast frequency so it's bound to pick up radio as well. So if you were to ask a yes or no question, you could either get nothing and you could explain it as oh it's a it's a weak spirit or there's no spirit here right now or something like that or you'd hear yes or no in which case you'd have evidence that you're talking to a ghost and sometimes it gets even stranger where you actually hear words that are appropriate to the situation for example you might ask are you a spirit and it could respond with dead but yes or no are very common words in the English language, so that alone should never be enough evidence to say that this is 100% proof a credible tool, right? And let's not forget that you are looping through radio stations broadcast frequency, so the word dead isn't too uncommon either. Oh, dead. Oh, dead. Now those are just examples of course, but it's like that with a lot of words. But of course these serve as evidence because you expect there to be evidence. And when you get nothing, you get to dismiss that with some sort of excuse. It's called confirmation bias, which is basically just a tendency to interpret information in such a way that it supports your pre-existing beliefs. And that goes both ways, for believers as well as skeptics. Paranormal investigators will more easily say, oh, it's a ghost, and skeptics will more easily say, it's just radio. Even in the rare occasions where you actually seem to have some sort of conversation with the spirit, Paranormal investigators will say that it's 100% proof that ghosts exist and that the ghost box is credible and skeptics will say that it's just a big pile of coincidence. And frankly, I'll have to side with the skeptics, just because it happens so rarely that you actually have a conversation with the spirit that you can't honestly say that it's 100% proof. Weird coincidences happen all the time and this is just another form in which they come. 
And that's why I'm saying that paranormal investigators should find a scientific explanation for how this works if they honestly want to convince anyone that didn't already want to believe. Because science describes things that make up our reality. So if ghosts really do exist, then we should be able to explain them scientifically. Maybe we haven't figured out how to do it yet, but if they exist, then we must be able to prove it. So let's say that a spirit could in fact send out radio signals. Considering that spirits have some sort of electromagnetic field around them, theoretically it would be possible. But it would be extremely difficult for a spirit to send out a radio signal. Because a spirit wouldn't just be able to say something and expect it to come out as a radio signal. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between English and radio signals to understand why. AM stands for amplitude modulation and it will send out a stronger or weaker signal in order to represent the audio that comes out of your speaker, right? But it will always send it at a specific frequency with some offset. And the strength of this signal is called the amplitude. AM radio also broadcasts at a much lower frequency than FM which is why you're able to hear AM radio signals from much farther away because uh, because the frequency is lower, the waves will actually bounce off the atmosphere and come back down in a totally different location, right? Whereas the much smaller FM frequencies just go right through the atmosphere. So let's ignore the fact that sound waves and radio waves are completely different types of waves just for this example. If a spirit could yell out electromagnetic waves, then it would have to yell out something like this in order to translate it into AM radio. So as you can hear, the amplitude or the volume changes, but the frequency remains the same. But through a ghost box, it would be even trickier, because the spirit would have to constantly change its frequency as the frequency on the ghost box changes. And with FM radio, it would be even more tricky. FM stands for frequency modulation. So let's say that you tune into 96.1 FM, then you actually don't tune into that specific frequency, but rather a certain set of frequencies around that. And if the frequency becomes slightly greater or slightly smaller, then that's actually translating into the audio signal. Now I'm not gonna generate an example of that because you wouldn't even be able to hear how small the difference in frequency is. But this image right here should clearly demonstrate the difference between AM and FM signals. Now with our current equipment it's pretty easy to translate sound into radio signal and back. But I can't really see how it makes a lot of sense for a ghost to be able to do this. Considering that they don't exactly have any equipment to do this. And even if they could it would still be very difficult to deal with the constantly changing frequency of the ghost box. And that goes for both AM and FM but especially FM. Imagine you're a ghost, you'd have to go like ah, ah, ah in order to produce some sounds that actually translate into English, right? But don't think that AM is perfect either. Because FM broadcasts the expensive mainstream radio with licensed music and whatnot. But AM radio stations are usually set up by amateurs or small companies who don't have rights to expensive music. Therefore you can expect a lot more talk shows on AM radio which obviously results in more clear words that can be interpreted as ghost communication. So, even if there is a way for ghosts to communicate through radio, then the frequency loop would just be making it even harder for them to do this. The only thing that the frequency loop really accomplishes is that it will generate more words for you to interpret as ghost communication. And that's gonna be the case with or without ghosts interfering. So let me provide you some alternatives that are much more credible than the ghost box. If ghosts really have the ability to communicate through radio, then you could just tune in to a dead frequency and see if there's any sounds coming through that. If there are, then it could still be explained in some other way, but at least it's much more credible than having to rely on a tool that constantly picks up sounds that are definitely not ghost communications. And I don't mean tune into some frequency in between radio stations either. I mean actually hack your radio and go outside the default broadcast frequency. This way it's going to be very unlikely that there's any interference from other radio stations made by humans. Because if ghosts really can communicate through radio then this should be much easier for them to communicate. And it's going to make the results you get much more credible. And if you find that for some reason the loop is actually necessary, then you could just make it loop outside of the broadcast ranges. 
And if the argument is that it actually requires some outside interference in order for the ghost to manipulate that signal or something like that, then you could always get an AM or FM transmitter and broadcast a sine wave or something outside of the broadcast frequencies. Now, of course, that's gonna take a lot more work, but it's gonna be a much more credible source than this ghost box, right? So if this really is the way to go, then you should be looking at some alternatives because the ghost box just has way too many flaws in it in order to trust it and to see it as a reliable source to communicate with spirits. Now, I don't think that the ghost box has the ability to do anything more than pick up a large pile of coincidence. But at the same time, if they want to prove that the ghost box is a credible tool, then they're gonna have to start looking into some experiments, for example the ones that I described just now. And while frankly I expect the results to be nothing, it would be the best way to prove the legitimacy of the ghost box. But let's take a quick look at the other theory as well, the theory that ghosts can actually interfere with the device itself and that actually somehow changes the output audio. In a sense this one is more likely to be true because it removes the language barrier between radio and English. But once again if this is the case then the ghost box is not the best way to pick up these signals. Because the entire design of the ghost box is basically intended to invite pareidolia. But here's an alternative experiment for that theory. You could get some uh, powered speakers like your PC speakers that you have actually have to plug into a wall socket and then turn up the volume and ask the spirit to do something while the aux cable is plugged into the speaker but not, you know, you could just hold it in your hand or something, right? And I don't know if you've noticed but if you actually touch your aux cable when it's plugged into your speaker, your powered speaker, then it's gonna produce some sort of sound. So in the same way a ghost should be able to interfere with it somehow and make some sort of sound come out of your speaker, right? But yeah, I've never heard anyone that actually has done this before or that suddenly uh, your aux cable is unplugged and there's suddenly a sound coming out of it without anyone touching it, so I don't know. But that's just an example, of course. Once again, if this makes sense, then you could just use dead frequencies for this one as well. Now the important thing to understand is with things like a ghost box is that the burden of proof lies on the people who claim that the ghost box is credible and claiming that there's a world beyond our own that we've never been able to see but that can somehow play with radio waves and electromagnetic fields of which we understand the workings yet we somehow still can't accurately measure it. I'm gonna have to stand by the point that we have so many scientists looking into how the world works we can see the smallest bacteria and we can see planets many light years away from us and we're able to estimate what it's like on that planet, right? We understand things like quantum mechanics and yet we've never been able to see the spirit that's supposedly floating right next to us. So the burden of proof definitely lies on the people claiming ghosts are real. And again, if they exist, then we should be able to prove it. But honestly, I don't see the ghost box as a credible tool, because if it was, then you would expect radio stations to randomly get hijacked by ghosts from time to time. And supposedly there's some bad ghosts out there as well, so I don't see any reason for them to not show their existence by actually manipulating radio stations' broadcasts. It would be a perfect way for them to let the whole world know that they exist, that they're out there. And technically, if they're able to talk through a ghost box, they should be able to do that as well. So it's a claim that you should absolutely not believe without some very good evidence. Especially since this is something that we can actually test and experiment with. Not to mention that the spirit box relies heavily on pareidolia and I think most people who use it understand this. It's the psychological phenomenon where your mind perceives a pattern where actually none exists. But if you want to use the ghost box you would have to be able to somehow determine what is ghost and what is radio. And if you're really honest with yourself then you should be able to see that words of significance are ghosts and irrelevant words or music are radio. Not necessarily because there is a ghost on the other end but because it confirms what you believe. The fact is you have to ignore a lot of logic to make the ghost box work. 
and people can pretty much see patterns in anything. That's what our minds do. So please, prove me wrong. The entire world is waiting for some proof for the afterlife. But honestly, I don't think that the ghost box is the answer. Now I'm going to be looking at some other ghost hunting equipment as well. So be sure to subscribe below for more videos like this. And leave a like if you enjoyed it. And let me know what you guys think. Is the ghost box a credible tool? Is there something I'm missing? I'm always willing to learn so please feel free to share your thoughts below. And yeah, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Ghosts! 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 No? No ghosts? What's up guys? Today we are gonna talk about EVP. People have been asking me to make a video on this subject for a while now, so I figured it's about time. Now, I'd like to start off by saying that no, I have never had a paranormal experience. And my attempts at trying to communicate with spirits through EVP have been unsuccessful. That being said, in this video I'm gonna give you guys some reasons why EVP is a credible tool and some reasons why it isn't. There's something that I would like to say right off the bat and that is that EVP may very well be the most credible tool for ghost hunting that we currently have. But at the same time EVP evidence is also much easier to fake than any other paranormal evidence. It's also important to note that I'll be talking about classic EVP in this video. So you have your voice recorder, you ask some questions and then you check the results afterwards. Because some people claim that things like Echovox are also EVP but you know, I guess, you know, that's debatable, but my point is, I'll be talking about classic EVP in this one. Echovox needs a whole different video. So I'll start by explaining how EVP evidence can be faked. Because I believe that if you are aware of the techniques used to fake evidence, then you will be less likely to fall for fake evidence. Obviously, I said it's a credible tool, but just because it's a credible tool doesn't mean that all evidence is real. The first and most obvious way to fake EVP evidence is uh, layering. So that basically means that you'll record some audio and then record a separate track of audio and then you put that separate audio track over the original audio track to combine them just like I'm doing right now. Now people continue to point out to me that it's very hard to debunk EVP evidence and this is correct. The only problem is that people assume that because it can't be debunked that that automatically makes it real. All that really means is that there's just no way to find any evidence of tampering in that footage. But it could still be fake. But in some cases you can actually debunk it though. For example when you record those two tracks and you do not remove the background sound then you will hear the background sound at twice the volume so that's a pretty big indicator that EVP evidence is fake. Let me just do it right now. I'll put three layers of audio on top of each other with just background noise. There, that was pretty obvious, wasn't it? But if I actually knew what I was doing and I'm about to fake EVP evidence, then I would just remove that background audio just like I'm doing in this part right here. My voice probably sounds a bit distorted, but you know, it still works. Then again, maybe you don't notice that much of a difference, I don't know. I'm in a pretty quiet environment here, so not really much background sounds. But that's how you would ensure that it's very difficult to find any evidence of tampering. Another way to fake EVP evidence is to just have a second person nearby with a device with some pre-recorded ghost sounds. Also pretty obvious, but that's something you might want to do if you are live streaming a fake paranormal investigation or something like that, right? Not the best option, but it sort of works. Then as a third way to fake evidence, I was actually thinking of just writing an app real quick that randomly adds sounds within your recording. But then I thought it through and realized that it actually already exists. <coughs> like a vox. But yeah, I'm sure there's plenty more ways you can imagine to fake EVP evidence, but you know, the whole point is that it can easily be faked. So you should be very careful when trusting YouTube videos with EVP evidence. But intentionally faked evidence aside, let's talk about some problems for real paranormal investigators. Paraidolia. This one just keeps coming back, doesn't it? 
When you enhance background sounds or just random sounds like this, you might actually be able to hear words in that. Not because a ghost is talking, but because our minds tend to look for patterns in audio. For example, if you're in an abandoned house, maybe you just stepped on something and forgot about it and suddenly you listen back to the audio and you hear that sound there and you wonder, huh, what is that? What could it possibly be? And then you listen a bit closer and you start hearing things that resemble words. And that would happen with or without ghosts in the building. So let's give that a try, shall we? I'm gonna just walk outside a little bit and then I'm gonna try to make sense out of any sounds. If there are any uh, ghosts here with me, please stay away from my camera. I wanna, I wanna make a point, so that would be very, very helpful if you could do that. Thank you. So yeah, that one's just caused by listening too much for any weird sounds that there might be there. Well, really, it probably can be explained in a normal way. Maybe it was like an object just falling in an old house, you know. Aside from pareidolia, there could also be some interference on the voice recorder. For example, AM radio, FM radio, hand radio, and cell phones. So, just like my cell phone is producing these annoying sounds that you can hear right now, um, a voice recorder is also prone to similar interference. Now, it doesn't affect all voice recorders though. Some are more prone to it, some are less prone to it. But it is a factor. Many skeptics believe that pareidolia and interference are enough reason to just dismiss EVP entirely. And based on what we know, I can certainly see the reasoning there. And some skeptics are extremely confident that all EVP can be explained through normal means. The James Randi Educational Foundation is offering one million dollars to anyone who can prove that EVP has anything to do with the paranormal. And they also offer the same reward for any other paranormal proof by the way. So far, no one has claimed the money yet. Which makes sense, because there's often no way to tell if something is fake or not. Especially with EVP, it would be pretty tricky to prove the legitimacy of an EVP recording. And of course, they will only accept conclusive proof. Which is more than reasonable, because otherwise the examples of fakery that I've shown you in this video would also count as proof. But still, if we do find some spirits and we want to contact them, then I would trust EVP over the spirit box any day. And if you think about it logically, it should be much easier for a spirit to talk through EVP than through the ghost box, for example. But if you've had as much luck as me, then you'll just go home with no results. But at the same time, no results is still better than fake results or unreliable results. Just like I did with the ghost box video, I also want to talk a little bit about how the ghost might be communicating with this device, if it is possible, of course. But it seems to me that figuring out how it works would actually be much more important than finding evidence that it works. Because how else are you going to improve the techniques instead of just, you know, continuously listening to vague sounds that might mean something else, right? So there are two ways that I can see that a ghost might be communicating through a voice recorder. The first option is that they are producing some sound right next to the recorder's microphone. So that would mean that the recorder would pick it up, but that you can't pick it up because it's, you know, very quiet, but it is close to the microphone. And it's not like the recorder will pick up any sounds that our ears won't. Or rather, if the recorder picks up a sound that your ears can't hear, then you also wouldn't be able to hear it when you're playing it back. Think of a dog whistle, for example. It's at a frequency that our ears can't pick up, but a dog's ears can. And the same thing with the amplitude, unless we actually just increase the volume, but then again we open the door to pareidolia. So that's why the only logical option to me in this situation seems to be that the ghost would have to be uh, producing some sound right next to the microphone. But if you've got a spirit that can actually move objects, then it should be much easier for that spirit to talk. Unless, of course, that it doesn't have the ability to speak. But in that case, EVP also won't work. 
just to say that yeah we make a lot of assumptions about ghosts but at least some of them can't be accurate because they contradict each other unless of course different spirits have different abilities in which case it makes perfect sense aside from the spirit generating sounds theory uh, the second option is that they actually produce sounds through magnetism or electromagnetism because a speaker and a microphone really are just small electromagnets as I am talking to you, your computer is sending a constantly changing current to your speaker to represent my voice. Increasing and decreasing that current will actually cause the magnet inside of your speaker to move back and forth many times per second. And that's actually creating the vibrations or the sound that your ears will pick up. And a microphone really is just the same thing but in reverse. Point being, I suppose that it's possible that a spirit produces no sounds but actually just manipulates the magnet inside the microphone. The problem with that theory is that you should expect the sound to be heavily distorted if a ghost is actually uh, manipulating the magnet, right? But yeah, that was just a theory based on my limited understanding but, you know, might be some truth to it, I don't know. So is classic EVP a reliable way to communicate with spirits? I'd say yes, but only if the words are heard clearly without the need to involve pareidolia. And of course, if you can eliminate any interferences as well. But at the same time, be very cautious about trusting EVP evidence in videos because it's so extremely easy to fake. And if no evidence exists that doesn't require the involvement of pareidolia, then maybe it's time to move on to other experiments. That was it for this video guys, be sure to leave a like below, share this video and subscribe if you are new here. And if you want to help me out, you can check out my Patreon at the end of the video, where you can pledge a few bucks for uh, some neat Patreon only features. Thank you guys so much for watching and thanks to my Patreons for keeping the camera rolling. See you guys in the next video.